The interwar period. It's called interwar because if you look at the dates, it's between the First World War and the Second World War. There are, uh, even though there are only around 30 years, there are also different names for this period. Uh, and we will talk about them as we go through time. So it begins with the First World War, 1914 to 1918. And the US officially enters the war in 1917. If you remember from high school world history, the First World War is not really like a world war. It's more like a European war. And it's, what was it? Mainly Britain and France versus Germany and Austria and the Ottoman Turkish. The US is across the Atlantic Ocean. They don't have to join, but because the US is allies with England and France, so even before 1917, the US economy was geared toward producing war material. So tanks and guns and bullets. It was at this time that the US got its name, the Arsenal of Democracy. Uh, but even with American help, uh, the Allies were still losing. So Britain managed to convince the US to enter the war in 1917. Before this, all of Europe was divided into trenches, Haugozan. And so neither side was really making any progress. When you fight a trench war, the key element is manpower. It, the more soldiers you have, the more likely you can advance. Because in trench warfare and with the invention of the machine gun, Ji Guan Chang, the only way to advance is just to sacrifice more people. So when the US entered the war on the side of the Allies, it brought with it a huge number of soldiers, and that's why the Allies won the First World War. Now, another important thing that happened to help end the war is that Russia left the side of Germany and the Turkish because they had something else going on. In 1917, the Russian Revolution, um, first, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, also known as the USSR or in Chinese, Sulian. <clears throat> so the Soviets supported like, uh, what was it, worldwide worker unions, and they did not want to fight against other workers in other countries' armies. So they left the war in 1917. So Russia leaves, the US enters, that's how the Allies win. Now, the idea of a country led by workers is terrifying to a capitalist society like the US. Remember, the US was founded by wealthy landowners, and throughout the 19th century, people basically didn't care about workers. So when an entire country and a huge country like Russia becomes led by workers and their goal is to spread their communist revolution throughout the world, you know, the US gets kind of scared. So um, immediately after the USSR is born, all of the countries around it start to attack it to try to take down this new government. Uh, obviously they fail, but it also leads to a change in the culture in, within the US. And we call this the Red Scare. Like in Taiwan, we have the White Terror. In the US, they have the Red Scare. And the idea is anybody who has ever agreed with a communist or said something in favor of workers was immediately suspected of being anti-government uh, and against the entire US as a country. So at this point, there were many, especially like artists and, and filmmakers and writers, people who 
had visited um, or are invited to visit the USSR. And, you know, they they only see what the USSR wants them to see. So, of course, they see like a perfect country. But when they come back and they try to say this, the culture, they get canceled in today's language. The culture canceled them. Another reason why this happened is because even before the, like, why did the US not join the First World War at the very beginning? A major reason is because of isolationism. This is the idea that America is big enough, we don't have to care about other countries. As long as they don't attack us, we should care only about ourselves. Uh, in Chinese, we usually call this something like so it's only after like Britain and France were about to lose and kept begging the US that the US finally entered the war. But this sentiment, the, this thinking did not disappear after the First World War. In fact, with the rise of communism, um, isolationists were arguing even stronger that the best way to protect our country is just to not have anything to do with the rest of the world. So famously, after the First World War was founded the League of Nations, Guoxie. Is that right? Guolian, Guoxie. There was a, it was before the United Nations. They tried it first after the First World War. It was too weak to do, actually do anything. But it was founded in part by US President Woodrow Wilson, Wei Xun. And yet, when it came time to pass a law to actually officially uh, join the League of Nations, the US Congress would not pass the law because of isolationism. So even something started by their own president, they did not support because it had to do with other countries. Now, as you might be able to imagine, fear of communists often led to people being called communists who were not communist at all. Anybody who had something bad to say about American politics or American culture was often canceled as a communist. This includes black people, African American people, former slaves. Now they are citizens, but they still don't have equal rights uh, because Reconstruction ended in 1875. So in this period, minorities, black people, women, anyone who tried to say that our system is broken, we need to fix things, got labeled as a communist. So in this period, when things, especially in the South, are not improving for black people, then many black people from the South think, you know, maybe life in the North would be better. And so there is a massive wave of internal migration hundreds and thousands of black people from the southern United States decide to move to the north or even to Canada. Um, now, as we know, racism is not only limited to the south southern half of the United States, but for these people who had no experience of living in the north, maybe at most they have a relative working in the north and in order not to disappoint their family this relative would pretend like the north is a perfect place so in fact when many black people moved to the north they were disappointed they still had to face racism but they were already there they probably spent all their money to get there they probably couldn't move anywhere else and you know they're not going to move back to the south right um, but at this period, this is one reason why uh, the population in the southern United States is still today slightly smaller than the north. But also for even for white people who were called communists, they often could no longer survive in the US, especially artists and writers. Nobody was buying their art. Nobody was reading their books. So in to not starve, many of them moved to other countries, which is emigration, starting with an E. One of the hot spots is Paris. Many famous American writers in this period actually were writing in Paris. 
So this also led to like something pretty fun happening. American efforts to fight against communism were military, but also cultural. The, especially the CIA often promoted American culture in other countries as kind of an example of how American culture is better than Soviet culture. So in fact, some of these writers, when they were moving to places like Paris, actually were supported by the CIA. This was, I think, the CIA's cultural high point. N never again would the CIA produce such great art. So that's what's happening in the general political area. In 1920, women finally gained the right to vote. They didn't do this easily. It came after a long campaign of protests, some violence, uh, and even like a bombing or two. Nobody gives up their rights. Uh, nobody allows people to have rights easily. You always have to fight for them. Maybe connected, maybe not, is starting in 1920, the United States did something crazy. They banned alcohol. Not just at the local level. This was a constitutional amendment. Shou Jing Jiu. Starting in 1920. You might be thinking, wait, how did this happen? Doesn't everybody drink? And the answer is apparently not. Throughout American history, if you remember from all the way back in week one, we were talking about religious people. Uh, evangelicals, Puritans, people of strong Christian faith. That tradition has never disappeared. Even today, there is a large section of American people who do things based on their faith. So around 19, before 1920, around this time, the evangelicals gained more power in Congress, uh, and they also became more politically active. They rallied around this idea that alcohol is bad. It is bad. Alcohol is not a good thing. Uh, and they linked this to many different social problems. So like the First World War, many people died, right? Uh, so then you start to have lower class people and minorities and women moving into jobs that white men used to do. And you also have things like um, after the First World War was the Spanish influenza. Uh, there was a huge pandemic at that time. In fact, some uh, historians think that the pandemic killed more people than the war. So there was a time of huge social changes and traditional people do not like social changes. So the, the situation united them and they managed to pass a constitutional amendment banning alcohol. Like seriously. So from 1920 to 1933 is called the prohibition era. Because alcohol is prohibited. It's also called the Roaring Twenties. I guess sometimes we translate this as Feng Kuang, uh, Kuang Huan Erling Yan Dai, something like that. Um, and it's it's because of prohibition. Like, if I tell you you're not allowed to use chat GPT on your exam, would you therefore just not use it? Or would you maybe think about using it and then trying to hide the fact that you used it? Same thing happened with prohibition. The government says you cannot sell alcohol, you cannot make alcohol, you cannot import alcohol, you cannot drink alcohol. So instead, people started secretly making alcohol, secretly selling alcohol, secretly drinking alcohol. And that leads to more problems. Before, when alcohol is legal, you know who is selling, you know where they get their alcohol from, and you can also like uh, make them pay taxes and set some rules. And if they don't follow those rules, you can find them. But if all alcohol is illegal, then nobody will tell the government where the alcohol is, where is it coming from, how is it made, who's drinking it. But alcohol is a huge business. It can't be like uh, all of these businesses are, are like independently operated and somehow are able to still supply the whole country with alcohol. 
So instead, what happened was when the government stopped uh, regulating the alcohol trade and instead just banned everything, you know, now that alcohol is entirely illegal, then only one group of people are best suited to manage this illegal industry. And these people are already illegal. I'm talking about gangsters. So prohibition was an era of violent struggle between the government and between the mafia and gangsters who now had total control of the alcohol industry. Some of the more famous gangsters in US history came from this era, people like Al Capone, um, who everybody knew he was a gangster. Everybody knew he was a powerful owner of the alcohol industry, but nobody was willing to give the government evidence because anytime somebody tried to give evidence, he would get killed. And so if you don't have evidence, you can't prosecute. If you don't prosecute, you can't put him in jail. Do you guys know how the US government finally caught Al Capone? They put him in jail for tax fraud. And that's how they put him in jail. So th this is why this period is such a lively, energetic and dangerous period of American history. Uh, and then, of course, because America is uh, the land of capitalism, rich people live by a different set of rules than everybody else, including during prohibition. You know, officially no alcohol, but really it just means no alcohol unless you are rich enough to have it. You know, rich people have their own logistics operations. They have their own contacts from Canada and Mexico and like other places. They, if they find someone who makes good alcohol, they can buy them out. Um, so really prohibition was seen more and more as ineffective, violent and unfair. So by the end, by the uh, early 30s, even the people who think that nobody should drink alcohol had to admit that this was not working. It was only making American society worse. And so finally, after many years, the US passed another constitutional amendment, basically saying, forget the last one, that didn't happen. So it was 13 years of nothing. Well, not nothing, it gave us a lot in terms of culture. Uh, so even today, if you watch like a Martin Sc uh, Scorsese movie like Gangs of New York, right? That's about prohibition. So during this time, we also had some of the more famous American novels. 1925, F. Scott Fitzgerald publishes The Great Gatsby, Da Heng Xiao Zuan. You guys probably watched the movie version a few years ago, starring uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. It's the story of a guy who talks about his friend and his friend started from nothing and using not exactly legal ways became rich and powerful but by the end lost it all again so it's actually a story very fitting prohibition right this is when you can make a lot of money gain a lot of power by doing things that are not exactly legal but because they're not legal the foundation of your money and power is also unstable, so you can lose it all again very quickly. 1925 also saw the publication from Paris of Gertrude Stein's The Making of Americans. Stein is best known as a poet, and I thought very long and hard about whether to get you to read her work. But it, I decided not to because her work is strange, let's say. In traditional poetry, the poet uses creative imagery, uses rhymes, uses uh, rhythm to express their idea. Stein takes this even deeper and she breaks down the sentence and she breaks down the word. So her early poetry 
is most famous for being repetitive and lacking in punctuation. She doesn't like periods. She thinks semicolons are the devil's work. Um, and so when you read her poetry straight through, it feels like somebody is casting a spell on you, like trying to curse you. Uh, and so if I ask you to read her poems and then I ask you like, what does this mean? You, you all would like go crazy. So I decided not to. Uh, but she is a very influential poet because of her experimentation with the word and the sentence. Um, only after she became famous for her novels and her poetry did American literature truly start thinking about the use of language on this really small scale as a, a land of open possibilities, not just you have to be correct. Uh, the next year, 1926, Ernest Hemingway publishes his first novel, The Sun Also Rises. This guy, I'm sure you know, Hemingway. You probably know him for the book, The Old Man and the Sea, Lao Wei Yuhai, right? Actually, that's his most traditional work. Uh, Hemingway is also someone who experiments, but his experiment is to say more with less. His stories and novels are famous for having very few words without losing any of the meaning. Uh, in terms of literature, his most important idea is the iceberg principle, Bing San Li Lun. And the idea is when you write something, you should think of it as an iceberg. One third is above water. This is what people can see. But you also have to have two thirds underneath the water. People don't see that on the page, but you have to put that into your story. It has to be there. Another way to think of this is think about an actor preparing to give a performance. The actor only has the words on the page, but in order to create a complete character, they have to fill in the backstory and the biography of the character. Even though we don't hear that, we don't see that, it is there. Uh, and so when reading a Hemingway story, it often feels like, OK, I understand what these people are doing. I understand what these people are saying. But I have no idea what's going on. Why are they doing this? Why are they saying this? What is the point? Because the, there is so little material on the page, you really have to uh, try to find the idea that the story is trying to say before everything suddenly makes sense. Hemingway is also famous for being a very macho man. He loves to do bullfights, he, lo uh, he loved to go deep sea fishing off of Florida. He loved boxing. He loved hunting wild animals in Africa. He had a huge mustache. And he killed himself with a shotgun because of depression. If you think about it, these two sides are connected. Maybe because he was depressed so often, he tried to do things that might feel more exciting, that might seem more meaningful to him. Uh, but unfortunately, he lost out to his mental illness. So because he is such an active, energetic person, he often was not in the United States. He was often in Spain running with the bulls. He was in Italy. He was in France. He moved around and did many things. He was in Africa climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in Kenya. That's the kind of guy he was. There's also a story about like Hemingway and Fitzgerald. They had the same editor. Hemingway, uh, he wrote a lot. Even though his stories are short, he wrote a lot and then cut, 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 cut. Fitzgerald used a normal length story 
but he wrote very, very little. So the comparison is somebody like Hemingway who writes too much and has to cut through the bullshit. And then somebody like Fitzgerald who knows what he wants to say, but has a hard time finding the right words. Very interesting comparison. Um, right. And the year after that, saw the first famous sound film, The Jazz Singer, produced by Daryl F. Zanuck. So film was born in the late 19th century. At the time, it was silent, uh, which means that the sound actually, like there was music, but it was live music. So at a theater, in, it, you had an image, and then you would hire like two or three people to like play the piano, play the drums, along with the film. But in 1927, this successful commercial film, The Jazz Singer, proved to the industry that people wanted sound. Before that, the technology was there, but nobody believed that people wanted it. They thought that people liked what they had. Because um, if you think about it, there is a huge difference between a silent film and a sound film when thinking about dialogue, when characters talk to each other. In a silent film, you see them talking, and then you have a, a card with words on them, and you read what they say. What do their voices sound like? How do they say these words? What is their attitude? What is the emphasis? What is the speed that they say these words? It's all up to the individual imagination. So there is a higher level of subjective participation when watching a silent film. But now that you have sound, you don't have to wonder. You can directly hear what they say. But this also means that maybe the way that they speak is different from what you thought they would say, the, they would sound like. Uh, so in fact, with the birth of sound film, many internationally famous actors suddenly were out of work because their language was not English, or maybe when they spoke English, they had a very thick accent. So this was not just about a new kind of film. It was a huge change in the culture and in the industry. You might have noticed that I did not say somebody directed the jazz singer. I said somebody produced the jazz singer. In fact, directors did not really become important until uh, we're going to get to another film later on, before World War II. During this period, it's the producer who matters. Producer is the person who has the money, knows the people, and basically manages the making of the movie. And so throughout this period, every time you watch a movie, the biggest name would be the producer. And then finally, one last thing about the jazz singer. It's a very racist movie. Jazz is a black cultural form. It's a black kind of music. And in this movie, you had um, a jazz musician who I guess the filmmakers thought he wasn't black enough. They made him put on blackface on his on his uh, face to make him look blacker. This today is considered, not today, this has always been a very racist thing to do because back during the era of slavery, white people sometimes uh, laughed at black culture, mocked black culture by putting on performances where white people would wear blackface to turn themselves into black people. And then they would do all sorts of crazy, offensive, stupid things. Uh, to show how stupid black people were. So, and this is why sometimes in the international news, you can sometimes see a story of like some famous person back when he was a kid uh, dressed up as a black person and, and people get angry. Okay, 1929 uh, saw the publication of Nella Larson's novel Passing. This novel only very recently became important. 
for many, many years, nobody knew about this novel. But as American culture today focuses more on race and race history, uh, people have started remembering that black people are not all equally black, right? If you look at the skin color, some black people are darker, some black people are lighter. And so the very lightest skin color of black people, these black people would sometimes pretend to be white. They would pass as white. Uh, they would wear white people's clothing. They would go to white people's shops and eat at white people's restaurants, which was illegal. But because life as a white person was so much better than life as a black person, this was often an enticing possibility for people whose skin was light enough. So this novel, which is not very long, it's a very short novel, tells the story of two childhood friends, two women. Um, they lose contact as they grow up. One day, the protagonist goes to visit uh, a mall in the big city and notices sitting in the white people's section is none other than her old friend who is black. And she's chatting with a white man who seems to be her husband, which is also illegal. And so the story is about the protagonist first finding out how her best friend became white and then trying to work through all of the emotions that this brings within her. Think about what you have to do in order to completely change your identity. You have to cut off your entire past. Out in public, if you see somebody you know from your past life, you have to ignore them. So you might have to move across the country to avoid all of your people. If you get in trouble, you can't call on your friends, you can't call on your family because you're no longer from that culture. And this is what you're leaving behind. When you enter into a new culture, you have to learn everything from the beginning. How do these people behave? What do they say? What do they care about? And then the most painful one of all, when you turn from black to white, you have to learn how white people behave toward black people. You have to perform racism for your own original culture. And all of these ideas are in this incredible novel. There, some people also say that it's a gay novel, like maybe the two women are actually in love with each other, which is possible. I'm not a gay woman, I can't tell you, uh, but some people have said this. Uh, and this novel was made into a movie about two years ago. Um, so like in this class, American culture, American literature, we don't have a lot of time to watch these great American adaptation movies. So this semester, I'm showing you a movie about Emily Dickinson on week 18. Maybe next year I'll show Nella Larson's passing, the movie versions. Who knows? It's starring, um, what's her name? Who's the actor who played Valkyrie? Uh, you know, Thor's right-hand woman. Thompson. I can't remember her name. Anyway, famous uh, African American actress. But novels like Passing were at the front of, at the time, a cultural movement called the Harlem Renaissance. Harlem was an, a district of New York City where most black people lived in the city. And uh, Harlem grew very quickly during this period, the population, because of internal migration, right? All of these black people moving from the south to the north. Anybody who ended up in New York had to very quickly find people that they can trust and that can help them. And so 
most of these black people ended up living in Harlem. Even today, Harlem is known as the a cultural center of black culture. Uh, so during the Harlem Renaissance, not just literature, but also music and painting and performance suddenly exploded uh, in New York City centered around Harlem. Suddenly, even white Americans had to face the full power of black culture and black art. So it's a very influential period of American literature and American culture. Um, in fact, we're going to read some poems from the Harlem Renaissance during this literary period as well. Uh, and as you might expect, a lot of this literature, a lot of this performance is about the experience of being black in a white racist society. And then finally, in 1929, William Faulkner publishes his greatest, some say his greatest work, The Sound and the Fury. William Faulkner, what should I say about him? He's from the South. He's from Mississippi, white guy. But his main topic in all of his really long and complicated novels is about the effect of racism and the closed off culture on white people. You know, usually we think about racism as being bad for those who are discriminated against, right? Black people, um, Asian Americans, Hispanics, minority groups. But racism is also bad for white people. Why? Because you're going about in your daily life. Sometimes you will see somebody of a different skin color. And you're not able to view them as humans just like you are. That does something to your soul. That does something to your mind to see a human, but not think of the person as a human being. Especially in the South, when slavery used to be the law of the land, many white people would see black people every day. They would even own black people, but they even when they knew in their hearts that black people were humans, they were not allowed to live life in that way. They were not allowed to welcome black people into white society. They were not allowed to treat black people as equal. Even if they wanted to. One e example that Faulkner likes to use is that in the South, even after slavery. I should start from during slavery. During slavery, rich white people would own slaves to do all of the work that they themselves did not want to do. So like farm work, right? Housework. But also, especially for rich white women, they would own a female slave, a, a black woman, to take care of their children. So you would ha often see black women's slaves taking care of white children. The same children who would grow up to be racist towards black people. So Faulkner sometimes likes to explore this transition moment. When does a young white person turn into an adult racist? And how does that happen? This tradition continued even after slavery ended. As we mentioned uh, before, when slavery ended, the American government didn't really help these former slaves, didn't give them money, didn't give them a train ticket. They basically just said, you're free, good luck. So instead, most black people ended up continuing to work for their former masters because they didn't have the money to leave. And the same is true about housework and taking care of children. Often, white families would have a black servant, not a slave. They have to pay them now. And they would have a black servant to help take care of their children until their children entered like uh, high school or something like that. 
And so often black women who did this work also had her own children. And so you would end up with black and white kids growing up together. And yet somehow when the white person grew up, he, he or she became racist. This is something that Faulkner uh, really thought hard about. And his answer to how this happens is about culture, yes, but it's also about what happens inside the human mind. Uh, and so in order to express these ideas about how white people think and how their thinking is perverted and distorted, Faulkner also experimented with language. Uh, so this is why many of his books are not easy to read. You really have to be able to understand what the character is thinking and what they are experiencing in order to understand why they are using this language in this way. So that brings us to the major literary movement of this period. In addition to the Harlem Renaissance, for white people, the major movement was modernism, Xindai Zhu Yi. Modernism is a very weird name. Modern just means today, right? Xindai. So like the name doesn't really tell us what it's about. Instead, we should think about what's happening in the culture during this time. First World War killed off most men. American culture wants to have nothing to do with Europe. They're scared to death of communists. Black culture is suddenly coming into prominence. And then you have people like Sigmund Freud, who published the uh, Interpretation of Dreams in 1900. So you have things like psychoanalysis, Jing Sen Fen Xi, telling you that you are not a complete mind. Your mind is separated into three different parts. The, the part you think you know is called the ego, ben wo. the part that tries to keep everything in control is your super ego, Cao Wu. And then you have a part that tries to break free and wants to do whatever it wants to do. right? Ego is Wu. sorry. Uh, the part that wants to break free and, and fulfill its desires, the id, ben wo, right? So it's a three level structure, ben wo, zi wo, cao wo, id, ego, super ego. And the ego, zi wo, is nothing but the struggle between the id and the super ego. So Freud is saying something like, you are not a complete person. Your mind is not a complete rational machine. Your mind is simply the compromise between what you want to do and what you have to do. Nothing more. So in this period, you have uh, concerns about psychoanalysis and psychology. You have people, especially white people, trying to find a new kind of tradition in order to, to seek a historical grounding. Like when most of your famous men and important men have died in war and you're facing the culture of marginalized and uh, uh, minority cultures, you start uh, feeling like maybe the tradition is not the tradition that I knew. Maybe I want to find something that I can grab onto and say, this is where we white people came from. But at the same time, you can't ignore what's happening around you. So you also have engagement with popular culture. Just a reminder, popular culture, the word popular does not mean everybody likes it. The word popular means this is for most people. It is not opera. It is not ballet. It is the kind of culture that everybody can join in. Uh, so the struggle between trying to find a tradition for white people and having to face these new kinds of popular culture resulted in what's known as aesthetic politics. The kind of art you like now has a political meaning. Especially during the Red Scare, right? Oh, you like this artist? Did you know that he's a communist? Are you a communist? Oh, you like uh, this novel by a black person? Do you think that white people are all evil? Suddenly art becomes political. Art has always been political, but not everybody had cared so much about this before. So even today, 
if you uh, pay attention to especially Western culture and American culture, often artists will be valued based on their political beliefs or their political actions or sometimes even just like their art is being used by one political party or another and the artist becomes connected that way. This kind of began during the modernist era. So like everything is changing, everything is complicated. So the literature of this period is also full of experiment. Uh, if you remember from introduction to British literature, we read some. Uh, I think what, what did you read? The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, right? T. S. Eliot. Uh, that is a good example of modernism. It's it's describing what's happening in the main character's brain as he's facing this situation. It's very unrealistic, very like a dream. But. Um, Eliot wrote even harder to understand poetry. He's one of those people who, in order to seek a tradition, didn't really care if anybody could understand him. His most famous poem, The Wasteland, Huang Ren, I guess, uh, is only three pages long, but some scholars, some professors have studied it their whole life because a lot of it is not in English. Some of it is in Greek, some of it is in, in Italian, and nearly every line makes a literary allusion. And this was Eliot's personal attempt to rebuild a kind of tradition for his literature. His most famous essay is called Tradition and the Individual Talent. And so there you can also see his concern with the idea of tradition and fighting against popular culture. The main point of this essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent, is that every writer and artist has to one day face off against the culture and the tradition in which he, in this essay, he grew up. Every writer, every artist has to face his own cultural father. And has to find a way to be different and to be better. I don't know if this is surprising to hear, but during World War II, Eliot sided with the Nazis. Uh, let's take a short break uh, and we'll finish this. It's not too long. We're almost over. We're almost done. Uh, after the short break.
1929, the Great Depression begins. When did it end? Well, the president at the time, Eisenhower, no, not Eisenhower, who was the president? Herbert Hoover at the time thought that the best way to get over the Great Depression is to spend less money and get everybody to save more money. Because if nobody had enough money, then you need to have enough money, so you need to save. Problem is, you can't save money if you don't have a job. So everybody agrees that Hoover just made the depression worse. Uh, in 1932, Hoover is not reelected. Instead, the Americans choose a guy named Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR. And in Chinese, we call him Xiao Luo Sifu. There's a street in Taipei named after him. He is the only American president to be president more than two times. He was president. He was elected four times. Because at first he actively tried to solve the problem of the Great Depression. He created jobs for as many people as he could. He majorly expanded the federal government. He tried to protect artists and writers by giving them stuff to do, commissions from the government. He tried to protect the environment by paying people to plant trees all across the country. He truly believed that during the Depression, people needed to do something in order to earn money. He was also politically very aggressive. He, at that time, many of his ideas were uh, blocked by the Supreme Court. So he threatened to add five more judges to the court. This, no, this move is called court packing, packing the court with judges that agree with you. So in order to prevent this from happening, the Supreme Court finally allowed some of his ideas to be passed into law. So because of his aggressive actions, the American people truly believed that he was the best president for them during the Great Depression. And then in the middle of his second term, 1939, World War II begins, and uh, Roosevelt brings the U.S. Uh, again into factory mode, once again making weapons for the allies in Europe. And this, historians believe, is what actually stopped the Great Depression when the government started spending millions and hundreds of millions of dollars on weapons and tanks and planes and bullets. Because all of that money was being created by the government and put into the economy by paying factories. And factories could then hire more workers and workers could then feed themselves and buy more things. And shop owners would make more money. Businesses would make more money, creating a virtuous cycle. So the answer to what ended the Great Depression? The Second World War. So of course, during wartime, when the US is doing all that it can to help its allies, most people would not want to suddenly change the president. So Roosevelt gets elected a third time. And then in 1941, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, Zhenzhou Gang. December 7, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. And so the U.S. officially joins World War II. And so now that the U.S. is actually part of the war and sending soldiers off to Europe, again, the American people are not going to want to change their president. So Roosevelt gets elected a fourth time. You might be thinking, wait, isn't that illegal? Doesn't the law say American presidents can only be reelected once? And the answer is the law only says that because FDR broke it. Before him, there was no law. Everybody just followed Washington's example. George Washington was elected unanimously after winning the Revolutionary War. 
after four years, he was re-elected unanimously. Nobody even ran against him. And, you know, it makes sense. He was the founding father. He was the most important guy. Everybody wanted a great leader. But Washington knew that if democracy was really going to succeed, they needed to have strong systems, not strong leaders. So after his second term as president, he declined to run for re-election. The second U.S. president, John Adams, also won re-election the first time. But at near the end of his eight years, he decided that he should not do something that even Washington did not do. And that is how the tradition was formed of a U.S. president only being allowed to serve eight years. It was not a law. It was a tradition. FDR, you know, he was facing two national emergencies, Great Depression, Second World War. He thought he had good reason to try to win the presidency again. And apparently people agreed with him. So after FDR died, he died of polio. Sharam Abi in office. Uh, the Congress decided, you know, we should probably make a law to prevent that from happening again. And so that's why today it is illegal for US presidents to serve more than two terms. I, I'm going I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but I really think like the Second World War story should be told in a straight line. So FDR dies before the end of the war. His vice president, Harry Truman, Truman, uh, is the person who decides to bomb Japan with the nuclear uh, bombs. Uh, maybe you went to see the movie Oppenheimer during the summer. Oppenheimer. Uh, and in that movie, there is one scene where Oppenheimer meets with Truman, who is already the president, to say, you know, maybe we shouldn't actually use this bomb. And Truman is like, you make the bomb, we'll decide whether to use it. Bye bye. Um, and so that's how the Great Depression links with the Second World War, links with the Cold War, Lenzhen, which will be part of the next literary period. So the Great Depression causes a lot of problems for the US, but it causes even more problems in Europe. After the end of the First World War, Germany, the big loser, had to pay an incredible amount of money in reparations. This is just a pay quan, which was impossible because Germany was at that time bombed out, had no money, had no economy, was basically unable to pay everything. Um, and in trying to pay, they had to spend money that instead could have been used for rebuilding and economic recovery. So Germany had a really tough time after the First World War. The economy was terrible. People suffered. One of the people who suffered a lot is a guy named Hitler. Uh, did not have a lot of resources at the time. Tried to be an art student. He got laughed out of art school because his art was so terrible. Uh, and instead, he realized that maybe I can use the anger of my fellow Germans to gain some power. And that's how Hitler ended up leading Germany into the Second World War. So like all of these things are connected. History is one long link of cause and effect. OK, but back to the US. During the Great Depression, there was also a lot of art, uh, mainly because FDR was spending government money to promote art. Perhaps the most important work of writing to come out of this period is John Dos Passos's USA Trilogy. This is three novels. The USA Trilogy follows the lives of 12 protagonists. Uh, and so he tells the story of the lives of these 12 people, but also includes historical evidence like newspaper clippings, magazine clippings, headlines. And then finally, the author adds his own diary to these novels. 
So it's very much a modernist novel. It's not just a straightforward story. It's using the story of these people's lives to try to tell the story of a country. While also including evidence from popular culture and also the author's own reflections in trying to find what is the USA seeking tradition. It is often one uh, it is often considered a contender for the great American novel. So like Americans really care about being great. One of the things they want to be great at is writing. So there is always a discussion about what is the great American novel. Some say Moby Dick by Jing Ji. Some say The Sound in the Fury by Faulkner. We just talked about this. Some say it's the USA trilogy. In 1936, Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind is published. In Chinese, the novel is called Piao, and the movie is called Feng Zhong Qi Ren. Uh, it's the story of a white woman in the South before and during and after the Civil War. So if you remember last time when we were talking about the Civil War and about the Gettysburg Address, I mentioned that after the Civil War, the Northern government tried very hard to get the Southern government back into the same country to convince everybody we are now one country again. And one way that they did this is by kind of ignoring the fact that Southern states basically rebelled against the government. I mean, they can't ignore it, but they tried to downplay it, saying it's, you know, it's not that serious. Everybody rebels once in a while, no big deal. Uh, and it, that gave space for Southern white racists to argue that the Civil War was not about racism, it's not about slavery, it's about the right of individual states to decide for themselves. But everybody who says this, ignores the second half of that sentence. It allows individual states to decide for themselves. To decide what? To decide whether to allow slavery. But anyways, there was a big push from southern states to try to ignore that part of history. And so over time, the idea of the southern states, the American South, turned from a land of slavery into a land of culture and tradition and like a, a different kind of life. Um, and so Gone with the Wind is about this young woman who grows up in a rich family and they are rich because they own slaves and their slaves do all the work. But the story doesn't say that. Uh, and, you know, she's a young woman. She's growing up. She has boyfriends. She's preparing to mar marry one of them. And then the Civil War happens and the northern troops storm down into Georgia, where, where the story takes place. And Georgia is a state where a northern general vowed to um, to burn a road all the way to the sea as a way to deprive southern soldiers of resources. Um, this is now known as a scorched earth tactic or strategy. The idea is wherever you go, burn everything so that the enemy cannot find any food, cannot find any water, cannot find anything to help them. Today, this is usually considered a war crime because it disproportionately harms civilians. Um, so the main character is also suffering because of this, like her home is burned down. She has nowhere to go. She has after the war, she has to travel north. Um, it's, it's basically a tragedy and it's a really good movie, except it's kind of racist. Um, as I mentioned, the story doesn't mention slavery. Uh, and the only black character in the movie is treated as a very racist in a very racist way. But aside from that, it's a great movie. Uh, and it was, I think, one of the top earning movies of all time before the 21st century. 1937, this is near the end of the Harlem Renaissance. 
Zora Neale Hurston publishes her novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Zora Neale Hurston is a black woman. She trained as an anthropologist. And her novel is about a black community in Florida. Today, most people know Florida as a place with crocodiles, crazy people, and Donald Trump. Which is basically the same way that people thought about Florida from the very beginning. Florida was always swampland, and weird stuff happens in a swamp. You think it's ground, it's actually water. You think it's safe, there's actually a crocodile. You think your neighbors are friendly, one day they grab a gun and shoot your house. Very crazy place, Florida. Um, but because it's such a crazy place, it also allows for a lot of personal freedom. So this novel follows a group of black people who start what they hope will be the perfect black town somewhere in Florida. Um, and the most important thing to know about this novel is that it is entirely written in black vernacular, Heiren Fangyin. Today we call this uh, African American vernacular English, A A V E. Uh, in Chinese, I guess you would say, which is an official term. So when you read it, like words are spelled in different ways, people use slightly different grammar, they talk about things in different ways. At the time, most readers did not know what was going on. But slowly, as black culture entered into the mainstream of American culture, this novel had more and more admirers and people thought of it as ahead of its time before people were ready to read it. Uh, OK, and then World War II, 1940, Richard Wright's native son. Richard Wright is also a black novelist. Native son is his first and most famous novel. And this is one of those novels that is that tells the story of a black man growing up in a racist white society. What's important about this novel, first of all, is it's a bestseller. Like people really love to read this book. But also that in this story, it's not just about the black person suffering. Wright also tries to give sociological explanations. It's not the fault of his main character. It's because society is structured in a racist way. And so he is forced to make certain decisions. He is forced to do things that people would usually not want to do. And so the point of the novel can be that you see a black person doing crimes, but you don't see the society that is forcing him to do crimes. Also in 1940, Eugene O'Neill's most famous play, Long Day's Journey into Night, is first performed. In Chinese, we call this Cang Yu Jiang Jing. Eugene O'Neill is often considered the best American playwright, uh, usually compared with Tennessee Williams and like uh, some more recent ones like Tom Stoppard. But he is one of the best American playwrights. This play is a masterpiece of psychology. It tells the story of one family on one day, spending the day together and being forced to face their individual failures and their failures as a family. So it's one of those like tragic falls, right? They begin as a proud, happy family, and the story ends with everybody in psychological pieces. It's kind of like the death of a salesman. You guys remember that one? I think like most of you studied this in freshman year, uh, approaches to literature. All right, that play is about uh, a father having to accept the fact that his son and himself is not as perfect as he thought. So this was kind of like a, a mid-century tradition facing one's dark sides, one's imperfections, one's failures. 
The movie version is also a very good movie. It's too long to show in class. Otherwise, I would really want to show it. 19, speaking of movies, 1941, uh, we have Orson Welles' Citizen Kane. Da Gongming, I think. Da Guoming. Um, Orson Welles it was a genius. He was literally a filmmaking genius. Citizen Kane used to be considered the best film of all time. Now it is currently number two. It was Orson Welles' first movie. And later in life, when somebody asked him, well, why did you do this? Why did you do that? How did you know how to do such great things that nobody had done before? He, his answer was, well, I didn't know how to do it. So I just did it the way I thought it should be done. And that's how he, he created a masterpiece. Citizen Kane tells the story of basically uh, John Pulitzer. You guys know the Pulitzer Prize, right? Jiang. You probably don't know that Pulitzer started this prize to improve his reputation because he had a terrible reputation. He was the owner of a newspaper agency and this newspaper did not tell the truth. At the time, it was called yellow journalism. Yellow because if, if white means the truth, then yellow means not exactly the truth. Uh, and yellow journalism became a problem in the late 19th century, early 20th century, because these newspapers would also tell false stories about other countries. And in fact, they helped to start the American-Mexican War because they turned a small incident into a big incident and the public had an outcry and the government had to respond, and the government's response was to invade Mexico. Uh, so Citizen Kane tells the story of this guy, uh, how he began his business empire, how he became rich and famous, and then how his life ended, and the only thing he cared about is the happiness of his own childhood. And nothing in the middle of his life, none of his achievements, none of his successes, none of his money in the end really had any meaning. It's a really good movie. 1943, we have what is usually considered the birth of the musical, Ying Rie Zhu. Uh, I know some people love to watch musicals, right? The Phantom of the Opera, Ge Zhu Mei Ying. Uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, Dong Lo Guai Ren. It all began in 1943. Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein II put on a show called Oklahoma. It's the story of a farm girl facing two possible husbands. It's, you know, it's not a very complicated story. What's important about Oklahoma is that um, this was the first time that the music and dancing was combined with the story and the performance. So before this, we had plays with the story and performance, and we had uh, what's known as burlesque or um, vaudeville, which is just people going on stage, dancing and, and like doing musical numbers. But Oklahoma, with the exclamation point, Yujing Tan Hao, right? Oklahoma. Uh, it was the first one to combine these two, and people loved it. It had music and dancing, but it also had a story. Genius. And so this was the birth of the musical. Um, finally, the last important thing to mention from this period is in 1944, the government passed a law called the GI Bill. GI stands for General Infantry. This bill said that if you fought in World War II, when you come back, if you want to go to college, the government will pay for you. If you want to move house and you want to buy a new house, the government will pay for you. If you have a health condition and you need money, the government will pay for you. And because most soldiers came from the lower middle class and the working class, this bill 
elevated the social and economic standing of millions of white Americans. Because the one big problem with this bill is that it excluded black people. Only white people could use the money from this bill. So it also helped to contribute to a huge economic gap between black people and white people. I mean, black people already started off uh, from a very terrible place, right? Freed from slavery with nothing. They had to work their ass off in the face of, of uh, racist society and economic segregation and discrimination. And then now the government says, even if you fought in World War II, when you come back, you get nothing. But all of your white fellow soldiers get everything. Like sometimes it's really it's really painful to think about how a racist society mistreats so many of its so-called citizens. In terms of literature, the GI Bill had a big effect on college culture and and uh, the culture of um, artists and writers and people who have learning. Because now soldiers who are 20 to 25, 30 can go to college and they're there because they want to be. The government is giving them money if they want to learn stuff and they want to learn stuff. So throughout uh, the 50, late 40s, early 50s, so many college professors had wonderful students, students who were engaged, who wanted to learn, who wanted to expand their knowledge, who wanted to really understand what culture and society and knowledge is all about, and also students who had life experience, who were able to connect what was said in the classroom with what they themselves went through during the war, and even before the war, some of these people were already married or adults before the war happened. Uh, and it, this bill helped to make American college culture enter the mainstream of American culture. No longer was college just about learning how to be a better farmer or learning how to be a president or a lawyer. Now college was also a place where people could learn for their own personal interest or their own personal benefit. Uh, and it also helped to expand the American college system. With more students comes more money, with more money comes more schools and more teachers. Um, so it was also a huge change for American culture in general. And then what happens after World War II, we will talk about in the next literary period. Questions? So these are some ideas you can keep in mind as we spend the next, I think, four weeks reading lots and lots of poetry. Next week, we're going to be reading poetry from two modernist poets, Wallace Stevens, and William Carlos Williams. Where is it? There we go. Yes, his name is William Carlos Williams. That's his name. Um, so first, let's talk about Wallace Stevens. Both of these are white guys. Um, and also, both of these people had actual day jobs. They were not primarily poets. Wallace Stevens was an insurance uh, salesman. His day job was uh, doing insurance, one of the most boring jobs you can have. And yet he was pretty good at it. He rose to become manager of his company. He was considered successful in his field. And yet he is most famous for his poetry, which he wrote in his private time at night. Stevens is considered a modernist, even though his poetry is not too hard to understand at the level of language. His use of language is quite uh, non-experimental. I don't want to say traditional, 
because it's not traditional, but it's not experimental. If you work hard at it, you know, then you can understand what he's saying. He's considered a modernist because he uses his poetry for philosophy. He talks about different ways of looking at something. For instance, the first poem we're going to read is 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. His poetry is often concerned with how things change when we look at them from different points of view. Uh, and even how a point of view can create the thing that we are looking at. So for Stevens, often the perspective comes first and the object comes second. If you were in my Approaches to Literature class two years ago, we read a Wallace Stevens poem called uh, The Anecdote of the Jar. There was a jar in Tennessee, right? The poet places a jar in the middle of nature and all of nature changes around it because it has a new perspective. So for Stevens, we're going to read 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. Uh, and then we're going to read the idea of order at Key West. Key West is at the very bottom of Florida. There's a string of islands, and those islands are called Key West. Uh, and then we're going to move on to William Carlos Williams. WCW, as I like to call him, was also not mainly a poet. His day job was as a doctor. And again, he was a successful doctor. He was a family doctor. In those days, you did not go to the doctor's office. The doctor came to your house. And so uh, each doctor was kind of had like a, a community that they helped to take care of. And WCW was very popular in his community. He gave birth to many babies. He helped treat many sick people. He helped accompany many old people in the last days of their life. He was a very successful and beloved doctor. And maybe because of this, maybe because he was dealing with life and death, sickness and health every day, his poetry is very vivid. His imagery is very strong. Uh, before we were reading poetry and it was like, oh, the flower and the grass and the sky. But when you read WCW's poetry, the, the picture in your mind is very strong. Again, if you were in my approaches to literature class two years ago, we read a poem by him called The Red Wheelbarrow. Did we? I can't remember. Oh, no, but we're going to. We're going to read this poem. Uh, so we're going to read from Williams, The Widow's Lament in Springtime, and then The Red Wheelbarrow. The Red Wheelbarrow is one of the most in famous poems in U.S. literature, and the reason is because it is so short. Ta-da, that's it. That's the whole poem. But it's also a very important poem, and we can talk about why. And we're also going to read a sort of a song. Also a very short poem. So, you know, for next week, not many pages. What is that, five pages? Yeah, five pages of poetry. Shouldn't be too hard. So that's before next week. Questions? OK, so we still have a little bit of time left. We can do one of two things. Either I can let you keep working on your midterm exam, and if you have questions, you can come and ask me. Or I can start teaching next week's poems, and I'll guide you through the first parts of 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. Which one do you want to do?
OK, if you want to have time to do continue the midterm exam, ask questions, study, please raise your hand. And if you want me to. OK, cool, so uh, the rest of today is your time, and if you want to ask questions, I will be right here.